Hey guys, so glad you're watching these sermons. So glad you're part of our church wherever you are in the world. A special welcome to you. Uh, glad that you're part of this thing that God's doing. It's pretty crazy. Uh, we're all around the world uh, online right now and people are engaging with the teachings. People are coming to know Jesus. People are sharing it with their friends. So thank you for that. Uh, if you wanna get more involved in that, become part of our uh, community groups. This is villagechurch.com slash groups is where you do that. And then uh, if you wanna give to the ministry, Obviously, it costs money to resource this thing that God's doing. So this is villagechurch.com slash give. Uh, we would love that and appreciate that. It is so cool to hear the stories. Send us stories too. I would love to personally hear the stories about what God is doing in your life. You can email me personally, mark at thisisvillagechurch.com. I'd love to read through those stories. Kind of the funnest part of my week. So God bless you guys. Uh, thanks for being part of this. Hey, Village Church, so glad to be with you yet again. Pastor Mark here. For those of you who are new, a special welcome to you. Joining us from different countries, different provinces. We love you. We're so glad you're part of this church. Uh, we are jumping into John chapter four. So if you have a Bible, go there. Uh, last week, we went right up to verse 26. And we were talking about this story where Jesus is talking to this Samaritan woman at the well. And there's all kinds of theology and stuff that comes out of it and stuff to do with following Jesus in the modern day. So if you got a Bible, make sure you have it out. We put stuff up on the screen for you, but it's good to have a Bible, mark it up because our whole philosophy is just going exegetically, expositorily through this text and explaining the Bible to you. That's my goal. Uh, my goal is not to entertain you. If we get a little bit of that on the side, awesome. My goal is to teach the scriptures, preach the scriptures in a way that they're alive in your life that we get the original meaning and then we bring it into our day as we try to follow Jesus in the 21st century, in this cultural moment, to the best of our ability. And today we're gonna to see this huge idea, which I hope is convicting to you. It's certainly been convicting to me as I've gone through this text about what it means to actually be missional in life, what it means to have a faith that not only stays here, but actually goes out to affect and reach other people. And this is gonna be key. So hopefully it's something that uh, we can draw a plan for our life, a, a big goal to go, I can't keep my faith to myself anymore. I need to be able to tell people about Jesus to see their life change because I wanna care about more than just the next 80 years and making sure we got this world taken care of. There's this bigger question about eternal life that everybody you've ever met needs to answer the question about Jesus because they're going to live forever in one of two places, either heaven or hell. And the Bible makes very clear this is a reality. And if we don't own that and feel that and believe that, then we're never gonna bleed to tell people about it. We're never gonna sacrifice anything to tell people about it. And Jesus is about to overturn all of that and blow up a whole bunch of paradigms. So hopefully you're ready for that. Buckle up, we're gonna go. We got a lot of crazy stuff to get through. So here's what happens. Jesus is talking to this woman at the well and he says this. Uh, I who speak to you am he. So he's uh, clarifying his identity. I'm the Messiah. I'm the one who is going to come to die on behalf of the world's sins and rise again to give everyone eternal life. You don't need to search anymore. If you're watching this and you're wondering who can save me, who can change my life, who can give me ultimate fulfillment, who can give me meaning, who can, who can actually forgive my sins, Look no further, all right? It's Jesus Christ. That's the point. That's what we're about as a church. That's what we want you to know. No matter who you are, where you're from, what religion you are, what you believe, Jesus Christ is the answer. And we are supposed to actually, at some point in our life, Colossians 1 says, not just entertain the idea of Jesus or Christianity, and look at it like some specimen that we kind of poke around and wonder about and then move on with our life. We make a decision about it and then we come to terms with the fact that, okay, what am I actually gonna do with the person at work of Jesus? Because this is going to change my life forever. I've got to actually make a call here. And so those of you who are wondering about this, there comes a moment when you, Colossians says, you've got to cross over from the, the, from the kingdom of the world to the kingdom of his beloved son the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom where it doesn't necessarily feel dark, but it's a, a world where we don't see truth. And we might feel fine. If you walked up to me as a 17 year old kid and said, hey, Mark, you actually need an enlightenment. You need to see. I would have been like, I'm fine. I'm living my life. I'm doing my thing. I'm having a good time. I wouldn't have necessarily sensed there was anything, anything wrong with me that I needed some solution to some plight in my life. I wouldn't have said that. But once I met Jesus, I looked back and my scenario went, oh my goodness, I didn't even realize how lost I was. 
And some of you, that's the scenario right now. And the first thing you got to understand is this identity of the only one who can save you. Jesus is the only one. And then verse 27 says this, just then his disciples came back and they marveled that he was talking with a woman. Now let's just hone in on that for a second because here's what you and I don't understand. In the 21st century, that's not a crazy verse. But in his world, that verse is actually crazy because we're talking about a super conservative, religious, traditional Jewish culture where a single man and a woman would not be just hanging out with each other in public like Jesus is doing with this Samaritan woman. You, even when you were dating, it wasn't like today, right? You go on plenty of fish or whatever, or you go meet with a girl and you, you, go, you just hang out, you do whatever, and you're alone in the car. And then you sit there and wonder, why is it so hard to date in the modern world? It's because back then you had a caravan of people that was always around you. And then you got married and you were never alone before you got married. And then you, and you, were, you were probably 15, 16 years old. And and then you didn't like do what I did, date for five years and drive each other around in the dark in the car and go, Lord, I'm trying to be faithful. It's like, good luck with that, bro, right? It's like, and so this was a super conservative culture and, and it was so conservative. And here's, here's the beautiful thing, this big idea of, of Christianity and women uh, coming out of this verse. In that culture, women weren't even trusted in a court of law. They weren't seen as equals with men at all. In fact, here's what the Talmud says. It was a Jewish teaching of the time. You had the Old Testament, and then you had like the Mishnah and the Talmud, which are later Jewish uh, kind of uh, commentary on the Bible and teachings that rabbis would talk about. And during that time, here was the philosophy. This is one quote from the Talmud. No one salutes a woman. He who instructs his daughter in the law is like one who acts the fool. So women were, were these, these like non-equal to men people. And yet I love this verse because here's Jesus upending this entire way of looking at women that the culture was good. He's talking to a woman. In fact, he's not only gonna talk to her, we're gonna see she's gonna go back and start preaching to the people that she belongs to after she meets Jesus. And this, look at this verse. Uh, no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? I love that because we start seeing this trajectory. Verse 28, so the woman left her water jar and went into the town and said to the people, come and see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? Jesus is talking to a woman and his disciples are starting to get to the point where they don't even question it. I love that verse. No one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking to this woman? Because here's the thing. Um, the trajectory, a lot of people look at Christianity and, and as we talked about last week and they go, okay, it's bad for society. It's toxic for people. Christianity is an idea that came into a world and set a trajectory of equality for all people. There's a, a book I read years ago um, uh, called uh, Slaves, women and homosexuals. And it talks about the idea that when you look at the Bible, there's this way of reading it that is a hermeneutical way of understanding how the Bible is setting up certain teachings. And what it says is that, look, Jesus walked into a culture where there was slavery, where women were treated in a particular way and had a particular view on homosexuality. And what it talked about is, is when you look at the gospel in the trajectory that it's setting for the future. It's a trajectory that's saying, look, sexuality is gonna stay intact. This isn't something necessarily that later generations are going to rethink. But when it comes to the question of slaves and women, the trajectory of Christianity is going to the point where both of these things are supposed to be rethought in light of the gospel, which is why Paul says in Galatians that there is neither male nor female in Jesus Christ. There is neither slave nor free. All are one in Christ. And over and over and over again, there's this trajectory of this is where it's going. And this is what's beautiful because every culture Christianity comes into, it, it brings this equality of women to the table. Jesus is talking with a woman. Just underline that. 
we just passed by that. It's super explosive, which is why, you know, even we as a church, we, we had to rethink this a little bit in regard to uh, going back to the teachings of the Bible, go, okay, um, should women be allowed to be pastors and speak in church and all of those kind of things? And we realized, yes, this is where the biblical story is going, which is why in the early church, this isn't just like behind every great man, there's a great woman, all right? This is like, no, no, the women are doing great things all through history in the present church planting, entrepreneurs, teachers, preach. This is why in 1 Corinthians, Paul's like, look, they're prophesying in the church. They're doing things, teaching, preaching, gathering people, mentoring people. This is the vision of Christianity for you. If you're a woman, let's go. I got three daughters. This isn't barefoot and pregnant and hopefully you marry a good guy. I mean, hopefully you do marry a good guy, ladies, but Let's go. You have a mission. You have an identity. You have giftings. You have a calling. You are a leader. Go, go, go and make an impact in the world. This is what Jesus and Christianity are doing wherever they go. Here's the problem. The church sits around and debates this stuff. I've, I've been part of churches that have split over this question. And it's like the rest of the world is sitting there dying and going to a Christless eternity and we're all sitting around talking about this. Hey, should I do it? What are you talking about? You know why we do that? Because it's what's comfortable for us. We love sitting around like, hey, what do you think about this? And what do you think about that? And Jesus is going, I'm trying to do this thing. And what's comfortable for us is for us to sit around and debate each other on minutiae that no non-Christian in the world cares about. When's the last time, and, and, and this is gonna be a huge part of the passage too, the missional intent of the church to go out and reach people who don't already know Jesus and is this part of your life? We're gonna see that in a sec. It's like, I've never had a non-Christian come up and ask me, are you a pre-millennial or a post-millennial or an all-millennial? What about the rapture? Are you mid-tribulation or what are we talking about? This is what we love to sit around and debate. This is what we love to sit in church membership meetings and squawk about. This is what we love to create division about. And the world is living their life, needing Jesus, and we're sitting around asking the wrong questions and having the wrong debates. Here's Jesus setting up a kind of beautiful equality of men and women. And even people who look back to the Genesis story and they go, well, look, Adam was made and then the woman was made to be his helpmate in the Hebrew. Listen, the word helpmate in the Hebrew, not only is it used for God all the way through the Old Testament, it was a helpmate not to like scrub dishes. It was a helpmate because God just said, I have a mission for you, Adam, which is you're in the, you're in the, the beautiful part, Garden of Eden, but the world out there is wild and waste. And I need you as a regent to go out and represent my, my rule and reign and make the wild and waste things and bring them into order. And I'm gonna give you a helpmate for the missional task of changing the world, of bringing order and beauty into the chaos and the wild of everything that exists outside this garden. That is your mandate. And I'm giving you someone to help you accomplish the mission. That's the helpmate. That it can't be accomplished without her. And so Christianity comes in and begins, yes, Jesus doesn't sit and do what we hope that he does, which is, hey, why don't you give us, you know, conferences on egalitarianism and, and race theory and gender and spend 90% of your ministry talking about that. That's not what he does. Those are modern expressions. He comes in and within his cultural context does things that leads toward a trajectory that overthrows the injustices, the oppression, the treating of people as if they're second class. This is what, I mean, uh, so uh, in Canada recently, uh, we record these sermons a little out of uh, order sometimes. So sometimes I'll be preaching a sermon and it's a couple weeks earlier than what you see. And so this is the sermon most recently uh, where we got the news about the, the children who were found locally in BC, um, indigenous kids found buried in these residential schools. And the news has been reporting this idea of what happened, the injustice of what Canada did for a lot of years. And when it took kids from these indigenous communities in order to kind of reorient them and they died in the keeping of these schools. And what's, what's, what's hard about it and why we would talk about it as a church 
is obviously there's many issues that the church could talk about, many injustices, but the thing about this one is it wasn't just a Canadian thing. It was a church thing. They were, they were, they were church, they, these were church schools that these kids ended up being sexually abused and neglected and they, they were, and, and they died and then they were buried and their parents weren't told. I mean, it's just awful. And it breaks the heart of God because Jesus' trajectory is to take the people on the margins and not to abuse them further, not to take the powerless and abuse them further, but to raise them up to make them something, to say, you're made in my image. And the whole Christian gospel is, is the opposite to taking people and saying, I'm gonna have to try to uh, do something that's gonna cause oppression. I mean, it's demonic. The opposite of that is what Jesus does here. He speaks with a powerless person on the margins and in speaking to her, gives her identity, raises her up and says, this is where I want my people to work. This is what I want my people to do. Spend their life and time on doing this versus what the church often does, which is the opposite. It takes the power and continues to oppress and put down rather than taking those in the margins and spending our life and our time and our money laying down our life, sacrificing in order to reach people for the gospel. So here's Jesus' entire life saying, I'm upending the things that all just became normal to you. You didn't even question this. And now I'm gonna rattle you a bit and I'm gonna get you to rethink some things about people that you wrote off. It's exactly what that verse says. And we just skip over it. And so the next thing that happens is this. The woman leaves her water jar and went into the town and said to the people, now look at this. I love this. She said, now obviously we, we just pass over that, but there's a reason I'm underlining that and circling said. She says to the people with her mouth, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? Can this be the Messiah? Can this be the anointed one? L let me just say this. Um, Christianity and, and, and a relationship with Jesus it's not just about you. It's about you bringing God to others. When, when you've, there's two things, there's two pillars of Christianity. There's, um, there's the discovery of Jesus and then there's the communication of Jesus. There's the finding and the telling. And for some of us, we've done a lot of great finding, but not a lot of great telling. Like we're not telling anybody. And she uses her, I mean, it's fascinating when I talk to Christians. I remember I used to, uh, my, my wife and I, when we got married, we lived in the basement apartment of, of these people. And we, we were talking to them one day and they said, we don't hang out with anyone who doesn't have the same, go to the same church as us. We don't have fellowship with anyone who doesn't go to the same church as us. And I was like, what? what, that's bizarro that you wouldn't hang out with people who don't know Jesus. This is the opposite of what he did. The salt and light image that Jesus gives us, what happens in the church, and some of you would scoff at something like that, but you actually, that's kind of how you live. Like you don't have non-Christians in your life. You don't have people who don't just believe like you, think like you, vote like you, act like you, talk like you, dress like you. Those people aren't part of your life. And this was the problem, what happened to Israel actually. In the Old Testament, Isaiah said, Israel, you're to be a light to the world. Like you're supposed to be a lighthouse. And here's what you did. Instead of making sure the glass was all clean in the lighthouse, shining out to the world so all people would come to know God, you put up mirrors and you started just talking about your stuff and your little nuances and your life and, and your whole life got spent just talking about the inside stuff and outsiders didn't care and you just became irrelevant and nobody cared anymore. That is literally oftentimes what I think about when I think about where the church is right now. Like we're all sitting around having our debates about whatever and the outside world carries on. It's like we're in the Shire or something. It's like we're hobbits in the Shire and the outside world's trying to, this is the Lord of the Rings reference, all right? There's one every couple of weeks. The outside world's fighting a war against Mordor and there's orcs and things running around and the people in the Shire are sitting around 
drinking their little beer, eating their bread in their nice little hobbit hole, carrying on as if the outside world, and this is what the church has done. I remember when I first started going to the church, I would sit in the back, share this, uh, I would smoke my cigarettes before I went in, and I, I was sitting out front of the, the, I didn't realize it was the pastor's office with the big window and I'd smoke my cigarettes every morning. And then, and then one day he walked up and he's like, hey, and he actually put his arm around me and leaned into me versus other people in the church who looked at my wife who grew up in the church and was like the best cheerleader of the church and the, singing at the front. And you got to stay away from him. He's nasty. He's evil. Look at him. He smells like cigarettes. All right. It's like, the church doesn't know what to do with people who don't look like them, think like them, smell like them, talk like them, look like them. So we don't know what to do. So we freak out. And here's Jesus. We, we spend time arguing about King James and NASB. And like I said, reading books on the rapture. And because you haven't talked to a non-Christian in a decade. That's why we have time for all this. And so here's Jesus saying, you, you know what it looks like to co-labor? With God, it looks like going and actually telling people. Here's what Spurgeon said, the old Baptist pastor. He said, um, if you would just tuck up your sleeves, Christian, for work and go and tell the gospel to dying men, you would find your spiritual health mightily restored. For very much of the sickness of Christians comes through their having nothing to do. All feeding and no working gives men spiritual indigestion. Be idle, careless with nothing to live for, nothing to care for, no sinner to pray for, no backslider to lead back to the cross, no trembler to encourage, no little children to tell of a savior, no gray-headed man to enlighten in the things of God, no object in fact, to live for, and who wonders if you begin to groan and to murmur and to look within until you are ready to die of despair. No wonder that's your reality because you're not working for anything. You're not doing anything outside yourself. And yet Paul says we are to be co-laborers with God who like Jesus existed to seek and save who? The lost. The greatest and most noble task you can do as a human being, listen to me, is to lead a person into a relationship with Jesus, period. Because what you're doing in that moment is answering an eternal problem they have versus always answering the temporal problem that you wanna try to solve. Let me get you new clothing and make you happy. Let me get you a new car and let me do this. Let me meet with you about your problem in life. Great, legit, awesome, love it. But if, you, if someone doesn't repent of sin and come to know Jesus, they have all of that great life for 85 years and everything gets worked out. And then what? You never answered their eternal problem. You never answered. And what the Bible lays out is when you do this noble task of having a heart that brings people to Christ, what happens is, is you get reward both in this life, the, the great quality, the great growth as Spurgeon's talking about of your own spiritual vitality, but also in the next life, there is reward. Jesus, now, some of you think I'm wacky right now. Some of you are like, what are you talking about? You get reward for leading people to Christ? Listen, we neglect a mass of biblical teaching when we forget that not everyone's experience in heaven is going to be the same. There are, go read the Sermon on the Mount. He's constantly talking about treasure that you get, reward that you get. This is why every judgment passage in the New Testament talks about our life. John 5, Revelation 21, 22, Romans chapter two, over and over and over again. What did you do with your life? Not because it saves you, but because it's gonna set the experience of delight and glory and pleasure for the next 80 billion years, what you did in this life, as the great gladiator line is, echoes in eternity, all right? That's just true. Now, some of you are like, what are you talking about? This sounds crazy. I'm gonna give you a passage right now. Guys, if you've been sleeping to this point, I'm gonna give you a passage to mess your life up. You, you might actually just wanna stop this video and be like, I'm done with this sermon. I can't take anymore. I'm moving on with my life. Honey, let's go to get some lunch. Guys, I'll give you a second to do that. Okay, great. Those of you who are still here, 
You're about to be taken on a ride. You're about to go through the gauntlet. I'm about to throw you one of the scariest verses in the Bible that's gonna mess your life up as it should. Listen to this text. Luke chapter 14, starting in verse 12. We're gonna put it up on the screen for you, which we always do, but I'm gonna ask the team to make this a little bigger. All right, some of you, you get your little spectacles. You can't really see the verse, so you carry on with your life and you don't do anything. I want this one to be big right on the screen so there's no excuses for anyone to see this. Cover up my face if you need to. Make it this big font if you need to. Here we go. Luke chapter 12, or, or chapter 14, verse 12. Then Jesus said to the man who had invited him, when you host a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or brothers, or relatives, or rich neighbors. Otherwise, they may invite you in return and you will be repaid. But when you host a banquet, when you, when you have a dinner, when you put out all your energy into making sure that steak is legit, that chicken's just right, that salad's awesome, that salmon is cooked, when, when you do that, invite the poor, the, the crippled, the lame and the blind, and you will be blessed since they cannot repay you and you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Mike, drop, done, go home. Thanksgiving just got messed up. Christmas dinner just got messed up. You're inviting the wrong people. Who are we spending our life on? Who are we spending our time and our energy on? Jesus just said, if all you do is have meals for friends, you're spending it on the wrong people because there's people out there who need you in their life and you're not even inviting them in because they're not the people who make us comfortable. So this week, lead, pray, step out, ask someone, if they want to actually know Jesus. Imagine you did that. Everyone who watched this, imagine you asked, you prayed and thought, and you asked one person this week, hey, what do you think about? Because here's here's what she's doing. See what she she said something. You want to know why this is important? Underline the word said. Circle the word said. What, What does that have to do with anything? Because half of you think that if I just go cut the lawn of my neighbor and make them cookies, that by osmosis, they're gonna figure out how to come to know Jesus. They won't. They ain't gonna go, oh, look, he cuts my lawn. I must be made in the image of God, a sinner who fell, uh, but Jesus Christ came as my substitute and died on the cross for my sin and rose again to give me life. And if I repent of sin and give my life to Jesus, I'm gonna be filled with the Holy Spirit. uh, Hey, thanks for the lawn cut. Free service, moving on. Of course, we love and serve in word and deed. My fear is most of us are just doing it in deed. We're not saying, we're not articulating the gospel to people and saying, do you you actually wanna give your life to Christ? Because you know what we've been told? Friendship evangelism, just hang out with people, just journey with people. And then what we do is we use that as an excuse to never say. So we got friendship evangelism. Let me ask you a question. We've just, just in our, in our Western context, we just assume it now that that's the best strategy. You lean in, you journey with everyone, you walk with people, and then they'll see my life and they'll go, oh my goodness, I want that too. Here's the problem. The data says it ain't working. The data is saying this is not working. And in fact, that it's just become an excuse for comfortable Christians in the West to journey with people until their dying day and there's never any fruit from it. There's, I mean, there's fruit relationally, but there's no conversion from it because we assume too much. At some point, we got to say. At some point, we got to move from sitting around, talking about, look, I'm excited about your new kitchen. Seriously, 
I, like, I'm excited about your new car. I'm excited about the, 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 the COVID restriction conversation that we spend two hours every day talking to every single, I'm, I'm excited about the weather. I'm excited about everything we talk about. But at some point, guys, we got to look to people and go, what do we, hey, what do you guys think about God? What do you think about heaven? What do you think about hell? What do you think about uh, your soul? Are these questions we're even having, are these conversations we're even having anymore, questions we're even asking anymore with people? At some point, she goes into town and she says something. At some point, we gotta make the conversation a little bit more explicit. Imagine Chris Watt never led me to Jesus behind my high school. Pray with me. This is what the gospel is. Imagine you just, you know, hope that I figured it out. Imagine he didn't do those things because he, he thought to himself, I'm, I, I'm too scared. Or, or, or I don't want to mess this relationship up. Or, or maybe I'm too cool or I'm too old or I'm too established. But he took the risk to articulate the ideas, to be on mission. This is why we as a church we want to plant churches. We want to be online. We want to be doing whatever it takes. This is why we spend money, time, energy on the mission of Jesus because the heartbeat of God is that people would come to know him. We have to make sure that we don't waste our time on the wrong things. There was a story I read recently um, from North Carolina. It was on the Raleigh News and Observer. Uh, a patient died at a hospital in Goldsboro, North Carolina. He had fallen, he had hit his head. They got him back up. They put him in a, in a wheelchair and let him sit there for 22 hours. He had a heart attack and died. And what they did is they studied the webcams and what everybody was doing and realized that the, the staff that were trying to, needing to take care of him were sitting in the break room playing cards at the time that he died. Here we are People are dependent on the message of Jesus to eternally live with him forever. And sometimes I feel like the people responsible for keeping those people alive and coming to know Jesus are distracted. We're playing cards in the corner. We're doing everything but the task that this text says needs to be central. John Calvin said this, by his example, Jesus shows us that the kingdom of God should have priority over all bodily comforts. Think about that. Do you spend your time on this mission? Do you spend your money? Some of you, you just observe, you just, you, you, you watch, you send your kids to youth group, you do the women's conference, you don't, but you don't give any money. I'm not talking if you're not a Christian. I'm talking if you love Jesus, this needs to translate to your pocketbook saying, I am for kingdom things to advance in the world. That's what Jesus was about. But some of you, you're just too cheap. You follow Jesus with everything but your money. It's hilarious. It's a tragedy. Because Jesus says the priority of your life needs to be this. And you can say anything you want. You can sing all the songs you want. You can talk any devos you want. But we know what we prioritize in our life, in our heart, in our mind. Those are the things we, we spend on. And the mission of Jesus in the world is something Jesus says to the church, prioritize this over just the new sparkly stuff all the time because this is eternal versus temporal stuff. Jesus says, uh, my food. Look at what he says. They went out from the town and were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. Well, what's, what's that food, Jesus? So the disciples said, has anyone brought him anything to eat? Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him who sent and to accomplish his work. Is that your food? Is that what gives you life? Is that what you prioritize above all things? And so there's an urgency. Look, look at the urgency Jesus talks about. Um, 
The woman leaves. Yeah, you're talking with her. The disciples come back. Hey, but he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said, has anyone brought him food? My food's to do the will who sent me, which accomplishes work. Uh, do you not say there are, see, here, here's what he does, talking about the mission. Do you not say, talking to the disciples, there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see the fields are white for harvest. Right now, there's an urgency to the mission. You're sitting around going, let me wait. Let me wait months, let me wait years, let me not, let, let me feed it in here, let me do it, this. I'm gonna assume, I'm gonna put a couple cute tweets out and everyone, he's going, guys, you're sitting around waiting for, for this and months and harvest, it's, lift up your eyes, the fields are white for harvest now. I would love for you to email me personally, Mark, at thisisvillagechurch.com and tell me the stories. Give me a week, give me two weeks where you, every morning you wake up and you pray for that one person that you wanna to try to tell about Jesus. Man, I'm, just being, I'm just being dead practical right now. Every morning, I wanna pray for Joe. I'm gonna pray for Joe that, he, that we get in a legit conversation about Jesus this week. I tell him about Jesus, we'll see what happens and send me that story. Give it a week, give it two weeks. Send me that story where you said something and Joe responded and you got into a conversation and you at least gave the opportunity because life is short. I wanna hear those stories about what actually took place when you said something about Jesus and you offered somebody to come to know him that you prayerfully thought about. Don't be waiters, he says. There are yet four months, then comes the harvest. I'm gonna sit around in that culture you'd basically, you'd, you'd sow seed in the ground and then it would come up probably six months or so. And then you'd harvest it. Uh, four months was a really good crop. It was like, okay, it's legit, let's go. Uh, it, it's not like our culture, right? Like we're, we, there's no greenhouses. You know, they're not eating strawberries in January, all right? They, 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 they have a rhythm of the season that they gotta actually wait for stuff. And they put it in and they harvest it, depending on the rainfall, depending on the sun. Four months is great. Six months is better, you know. And they're saying, let's just wait. Let's just wait a little longer. Let's just wait a little longer. And Jesus is like, listen, there's an urgency here. There's an urgency here. Look, the harvest is now. Lift your eyes up. It's white for harvest. It's now. Pick it. Go. Now, I mean, I, we had a whole bunch of people when we started Village Church say, there's no more, it's not now. Nobody comes to know Jesus anymore. We're in the post-Christian West. Nobody likes Christianity anymore. Don't bother doing it. Listen, and two th almost 2,000 baptisms later, and sites in Calgary and all around Vancouver and Winnipeg and Toronto, all of that online later, Fields are white for harvest. I'm ready to go. Jesus is going, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to save people still. If you believe, if you speak, if you do your part, I'll do my part. Let's go. You only have so much time. You got 15 minutes on this planet. And that's why we, we want to plant. We want to see new churches reach new people and new kinds of people. That's why we want to plant. Some church has been sitting around, they're 100 years old, they've never taken a group of people and planted in another city, another town down the road, ever. And we go, wait, well, what else is there to do? You don't think my job would be easier? Just one site, sit, one, one site, one staff, one city, let's go. I'm going on vacation, kick the feet up, no complications. Is it open in Winnipeg? No. Is it open in Ontario? Maybe. Is it open in Langley, kind of? Is it open? The complication, the complexity of resources and all of it, all of our staff know it'd be easier. But it also wouldn't be the heart of God for us as a church to stop grinding it, to expand the kingdom of Christ in the world with the little bit of time in this moment we have. That's the heart of Jesus. The fields are white for harvest, Let's go, there's an urgency, it's gonna be messy, it's not gonna be perfect, but we gotta go, now. What happens is we believe a different story. We believe the harvest is not white, that it's useless, and there's no point in doing this. So that's 
the one big idea I want us to take today, this mission that Jesus has us on. Let's do it. Let's accomplish what he's put before us and not waste another day. And not only shall, should we this week and this month and this year serve by deed, now we gotta start serving by word. We gotta give people the opportunity to hear the articulated gospel of Jesus and respond to it. So Father, my big prayer for that one big idea is we as a church, whoever's watching this, would actually do that this week, this month. And we would see people come to know Jesus because of it, that we would stop making excuses and we would do what this text is telling us to do. We meet you, we find you, then we tell. We discover, then we communicate. Take away the excuses, take away the complacency. Let us be disrupted. Let us feel the urgency and let us begin to accomplish this mission in the friendships and the neighborhoods and the places we are in this moment so that people would come to know you. Because not only are we sitting there saying we want them to know you so that they can go to heaven when they die, we want them to know the joy now in the present, to have the kind of love and fulfillment and joy and peace and power that you bring into their life that that's what we would actually bleed for and serve for and live for. And if we don't have that heart, just give it to us supernaturally right now. Let us receive it and live in it and walk in it. In Jesus' great name we pray, amen. 